19th century, much of this land echoed to the sounds of war. Māori and forces allied to the British Army battled it out over land in what's become known as the New Zealand Wars. Today though, the signs of war have long been obscured. Time has blurred them into the landscape. But on the outskirts of New Plymouth, archaeologists have unearthed a village or pa long forgotten. Protecting it is a unique series of gunfighter trenches dating from before the outbreak of war in Taranaki. Now a team skilled in virtual imaging is rebuilding this pa in a computer to better understand how people lived and defended themselves during these troubled times. Each morning, thousands of Aucklanders drive past one of Aotearoa's largest fortified pa. One Tree Hill is one of dozens of pa that once was scattered across the whole Auckland region, taking advantage, of course, of the many, many volcanic cones that are dotted around the isthmus. Yeah, you can see down here, of course, all the scarps and ditches that would have formed part of the defences. You can also see the indentations, the many Coomera pits where the grown Coomera was stored. You can just imagine what it would have looked like. Pa have been part of the New Zealand landscape for 500 years. It's thought they were originally built as an expression of mana, but they were later fortified to repel hand-to-hand -hand attacks during tribal disputes. But what we're looking at isn't just the result of a computer artist's imagination, oh no. An Auckland archaeologist is using this virtual technology to help him visualise and interpret a unique pa recently excavated. It lies near an outer suburb of New Plymouth. Well, as you can see, we're in Taranaki, but we're also in the middle of one of New Zealand's largest archaeological digs. In fact, it's so big, it's hard to get an idea of the sheer scale of the site. I guess what we need is an aerial view. Not bad, eh? Three and a half thousand square metres, that's almost an acre, and it's only part of what was once here. It's a Maori fortified village or pa, and archaeologists are even further excited by the fact that it contained several generations of building. More specifically, it's a gunfighter pa, distinguished by that elaborate system of defensive trenches. Although designed for musket fire, there's no evidence blood was ever spilt here allowing local iwi to lift the tapu and excavations to begin. A team led by Auckland University archaeologist Simon Holdaway were given a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to bring this fortified village back to life. We're literally looking at the structure of the village and that's a fantastic opportunity for archaeologists. You know of course from New Zealand history that the, the 1860s is the time of the New Zealand wars so we're looking at that right on the kind of cusp of that, of that time. And what we found is, is basically a whole village dating from the 1850s. Over three summers, Simon's team unearthed thousands of artefacts, giving them a chance to glimpse the changes that had taken place in Māori society at the time. While rusty fish hooks, broken crockery and old bottles might be rubbish to you and me, to an archaeologist they show how Māori had adapted European materials for daily use. The abundance of clay pipes, for example, suggests smoking was a big social activity. The volume of material collected is evidence that this place was once a thriving centre. The village, known to Māori as Oropureri, showed up on old survey maps right in the path of a proposed roading bypass between New Plymouth and Bell Block, prompting excavations funded by Transit New Zealand to begin. Ah, now Simon, this is what I've always imagined archaeology to be about. 
tell us exactly what you're doing here. Well, in technical terms, I'm cleaning down a section. That is, I'm cleaning down the dry dirt that you see here. And you can see I'm getting layers, different coloured layers coming out. There's a black area there, big yellow one at the top. And just look what happens as I come across here, right? Bang, we come onto that really hard yellow. You see the, see the difference oh, yeah, in the colour, yeah. right? What tells us is that this is the natural. This yellow is actually the natural that Maori people in the 19th century dug into to create this trench. And we go down here, pull it back, bang, there's the floor. Look at that hard yellow, and you can feel it. Whoa, that feet have walked across that, right? And this is the soft fill that, that formed when the trench was filled in. Soft stuff is obviously where you find artefacts. Absolutely, that's the sort of thing. And in fact, we've got one just, just coming out here. You can see that glass, lovely glass bottle yeah. that's been embedded in the fill when the trench was filled in. So from this, you can tell that these are the exact dimensions of the whole, of the whole trench. Absolutely. What we're looking at is both sides. We've got the floor, obviously. Now they're a little bit lower, almost certainly because we're looking at a little mound kind of sitting on the, the outside. The earth that was dug out, put on Absolutely, the outside. Absolutely, yeah, and that's kind of eroded away. But we've got the outline of the trench. One of the features I noticed and why I've stopped here is because of these little promontories of, of dirt. They're all the way along the, along the trench and I see that they alternate. What's the purpose of this? They're neat, aren't they? They're called traverses. They, they're kind of protrusions pushing out into the trench and the idea is that if I'm the enemy, right, and I've somehow got into this trench, well, I'm trying to shoot you. Oh, I can duck down You duck behind and, yeah, and I'd, I wouldn't be able to shoot you, right? And also all along the way, both sides, we've got these, these post holes Palisades, defences? Palisades, fencing, literally, right? What we've got probably is a little earth mound here, then uh, a major set of palisades, a major set of posts forming a big fence. This one's dual, in fact. We've got, we've got post holes here, kind of a trench running along here, another hole there. Then you can see there's a second line yeah. running on the outside. So we've got two layers of fencing or palisading. You can imagine there'd be a little kind of mound here for material probably dug out of the floor, right? We're kneeling down with our muskets, right? We're pointing them through the palisading. Yeah. Right, and we can see out there the people coming so two at layers us. of palisading, we can just get the muskets yeah, through, absolutely. so you've got your defence as well. Imagine the poor people coming coming at us, right? They're not going to be able to see Anything. us, it's right? just gunfire. Just gunfire. But the key to bringing Oropereri back to life will lie in the technology Simon's using to interpret his finds. At Geometria in Auckland, another team is reconstructing the Oropereri trench and palisade system in a computer. Hi guys. Oh, hi Simon. Hey, how are you? Oh, yeah, that looks that's a bit right. better. It looks really cool. New surface for you. Yeah, that's great. So that's the trench then running along there? Yep, yeah. exactly. Okay, yeah. Led by archaeologist Hans Dieter Bader, they're using laser technology to log artefacts found in the field. We used scanning technology to actually to provide a computer image of every little depression, every post hole, every pit that we found. And we're stitching this together into a three-dimensional rendition of what the site looked like. So this is 21st century oh, archaeological absolutely. practice and this is, this is all new for us. And yes, this is uh, the first time this sort of technology has been brought to archaeology in New Zealand. And it's going to give us a, uh, a really great window into a, a very important historical time in New Zealand. This computer animation will illustrate how Māori defences worked. It also explains why Māori needed to rapidly adapt their pass systems for the next major advance in weaponry, the introduction of the musket. As the lost Taranaki village of Oropureri is brought back to life, archaeologists are seeking answers from the excavation. Why was it necessary to defend the village with such an elaborate series of defensive trenches? And what was life like for the people who lived there? Today, descendants are just as curious to learn about their past and to reclaim knowledge lost to the tribe. 80-year-old Ted Tamati is Komatua of the Pukatapu Hapu of Te Atiawa. He once lived nearby, not realising Orupureri ever existed. We used to run over, play with the children that lived in the cottage on this property. And we never knew that the, this was here in those days. The diggings over there, what were they for? 
Um, there are Coomera pits. Um, Early contact with settlers meant they would have been growing corn, turnips and potatoes alongside their traditional Coomera. A plough was even unearthed, showing Māori had also embraced European methods to cultivate their land. Life would have been good for the folk of Oropureri, but all that was about to change. In the 1840s, Governor Fitzroy limited the amount of land available to Europeans in the New Plymouth area. But trouble started to brew when the number of Pākehā settlers outstripped the supply of land. Some Māori wanted to sell, while others did not. In 1854, factions within the Pukatapu Hapu attacked and killed six of their own, who were marking out land to sell near Bell Block. So this is an intra-tribal warfare between... Well, intra-hapu, actually, right, within one hapu, Pukatapu Hapu. So Māori versus Māori over land. You know, it's Taranaki, land is the central political thing. It's likely these trenches and palisades were added during this Pukatapu feud. But there's little evidence of serious conflict ever taking place here. A year after the feud began, the British Army arrived in Taranaki to protect the increasing number of European settlers. Outside New Plymouth, stockades were erected as safe havens in case of Māori raids. One of the largest was constructed at Omata, just west of New Plymouth. Today, local businessman John Matthews is building an exact scale reconstruction of the massive Omata stockade, originally built on a nearby site in 1860. Why was the stockade originally built, John? Was it a garrison or a fortress? Well, it was really both. And it was uh, built by the settlers and by the militia as a consequence of the New Zealand land wars where there were some uh, 180 houses burnt down in this area. And uh, so this was a, a refuge to get to, as well as a place for uh, military people to um, uh, be housed and uh, to be able to go out and uh, defend themselves. A truly strategic location. Absolutely. Stockades like Omata were the European equivalent of the fortified Māori Pa, where people could retreat when danger threatened. By 1860, full-scale war between Māori and European had broken out in Taranaki. Māori had to be inventive to counter the firepower of the colonial forces. In attack, they engaged guerrilla tactics and surprise raids. While in defence, they tied flax to their palisades, which hid their positions from the advancing British and may even have deflected incoming fire. But Māori still struggled to combat the greater firepower and range of the British weaponry. An expert in the weapons of the New Zealand wars is John Milligan of Auckland. The muskets Māori traded were initially used in the inter-tribal musket wars. But these weapons were already obsolete, putting Māori at a real disadvantage when they came up against the British. So John, is this the sort of the, the range of weapons you would have seen during the land wars? Yeah, common on any battlefield then, this is the, um, the Brown Bess, which had been around for about 200 years. It's the, the gun that won the empire for the British. Um, many Māori still would have had those, even though they were obsolete. Was that on its way out during that period? Uh, yeah, it had been superseded by the percussion system, uh, which was um, uh, much more reliable. So a chief might have had a, a two-barrel gun like this, a two-putter. Um, nice, light, handy bush weapon, mm. um, but a short-range weapon. Using the two-putter, a skilled warrior was able to fire off more than six shots per minute using a unique method of loading. It was quick and proved very effective at short range. With accuracy, the only thing compromised. But then the Great Leap Forward happened in the mid-19th century with the rifled musket. And this is an Enfield, which was the standard British arm. It um, had an expanding bullet that could kill at 800 yards. That was a distinct advantage that the British had over the Maori.
and that forced them to change their tactics. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the power they built and the way they used their weapons. By 1863, the war spread to Waikato. Between Lake Waikare and the Waikato River, at the small settlement of Rangiriri, Māori attempted to stop the expansion of the British South by building a sophisticated defence system. But Māori were confronted with another technological challenge, the gunboat. They could no longer depend on modest trench and palisade systems like the one at Oropureri for cover. They needed to think big. Auckland Museum archaeologist Nigel Prickett. This was a barrier fortification that extended from the, from the river behind us over to the lake uh, and it was an attempt to stop the advance of the British Army into the Waikato. Now the British got past it of course because they had gunboats on the river so they could land troops up river. Uh, but uh, it was an attempt to stop the advance of the British Army. When the British uh, brought the army to New Zealand, the Maori had to contend with artillery. So for that reason, Maori had much stronger and more sophisticated fortifications than the British did. Adapt or die? Adapt or die. They, they were very good military engineers and they, they were up against it. So they dug themselves deeper, uh, they dug these underground bunkers uh, uh, and set out the bombardment and then manned the firing trenches when the attack came in. The Maori defenders staved off several charges from the government forces. But at nightfall, half the defenders slipped away, leaving those remaining to negotiate a settlement. They were instead taken prisoner, and the Crown claimed victory. The cleverly adapted barrier trench system was not enough to prevent their defeat. How does the site here at Rangariri, these trenches, this power system here, how is it different from Bell Block? Um, well, it's very different from Bell Block. Uh, Bell Block uh, was quite a small, confined fortification and it defended the people of, of that settlement. During the Taranaki Wars, the Bell Block settlement of Oropureri was abandoned and the trenches filled in. After the war, people returned and a huge Faranui or superior house was constructed. You said there were several generations of building or several generations of site, but later on it was dominated by one superior house, wasn't it? It was. It's after the village is probably uh, no longer occupied, right? The defensive trenches are filled in. There's a, a large house which is just right here. Uh, a large house, I guess, or really a meeting house. So what are the major indicators that you have to know that the meeting house was here? Well, I guess the really great thing about this meeting house is that we've got the whole layout of the house. We've got a whole series of post holes, and that really tells us about the structure of the house. Pre-European houses were, were tied, not nailed. They were tying the timbers together. This one's been nailed. So they're just aspects of the technology have changed, yet the design, the layout, is classic Maori. But it's the post holes that hold the key for the computer animators, whose next challenge will be the virtual reconstruction of the largest meeting house ever excavated. They'll preview it to a group from Te Atiawa making a special trip north. With the Oropureri excavation over, Simon and the team have gathered over 50,000 items, reflecting every facet of Māori life back to the 1840s. At Auckland University, Simon Holdaway is completing the data entry of these artefacts. So this is the computer map of the whole site. All of it, yeah, all these features that we excavated last time that we talked about, the, the post holes, the pits, this is the gunfighter trench yeah. running along here. This is really fundamental for us, the ability to put the whole site into the computer because it allows us to really manipulate the site, to zoom in, to zoom out, have a look at different areas. Coming on the screen here are all the different fragments of bottle glass. You know, just the tiny broken pieces, mm. and we map every single one of them. There's about 15,000. 15,000? Yeah, there's a lot that have been concentrated on the it's screen. It's like a forest. It does, but doesn't it? But you can see it actually runs on the outline of the big house, mm. right, round the back of it. Why not on this side? Well, that's very interesting. I think what we're looking at is people throwing away glass bottles, fragments of glass bottles in particular areas and this area is clear suggesting that people are still using that area when the big house is uh, being constructed and immediately after it's being used. 
In the lab, the visiting iwi members are able to inspect remnants from another era in their tribal history, a time when European influences were beginning to show. One fascinating find is this piece of engraved slate. When turned into negative, it appears to show a warrior firing a gun over the parapet, another clue why the village was fortified. Remarkable. For Ted Tumaty, it's a precious glimpse into his past. And the computer animators are ready to reveal the newly reconstructed superior house. This one was huge, over 20 metres long and 7 metres wide. It needed to be big to hold large groups wanting to discuss land. The Faranui had many European influences, like glass windows, iron hinges, and it was nailed together, not tied. Nigel, how much of a role has archaeology played in our understanding of what happened during the New Zealand Wars? Well, the first thing archaeology does, it, it, it puts the action out into the landscape where it belongs, rather than in the libraries and the universities. But uh, more than that, archaeology, from going to the sites, you can understand that the military choices that were being made by both sides. It was a time when Māori were forced to rapidly change their traditional pā to cope with first muskets and then artillery in what was a particularly turbulent part of our history. Computer simulations like this have given archaeologists a powerful tool to help us all understand what life was like in a 19th century Māori village.